Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And it's, uh, it's, it's good to see you all here. So, um, <clears throat> last week we had that wonderful talk by, um, by uh, Elizabeth. Um, it was much appreciated. And, and I, um, the, the week before that, I had talked about a poem. And I would like to talk about another poem today. But before we get into that, <clears throat> when I uh, introduced um, the discussion of the poem last time, I introduced several sort of classic Buddhist themes. The three marks of existence, uh, the, the four Dharma seals. And, and I'd like to say a little bit more about those because I think, um, I think there, there can be some confusion about their intent and their meaning. And of course, there's endless things I could say, but some things that occurred to me are along these lines. Now, just, just to review briefly, so the um, The three marks of existence, anicca, <clears throat> all compounded things are impermanent, dukkha, all compounded things are unsatisfactory, anatta, all phenomena are without a fixed separate essence. And then, and these are found in, you know, the very, very earliest Pali suttas, as well as in the Dhammapada. And, and a slight modification of them uh, appear in Mahayana literature, the four Dharma seals, all compounded things are impermanent, all compounded things are unsatisfactory, all phenomena are empty, Nirvana is peace. So, um, So what do we make of these statements? Uh, I, I think there, there is a, um, a tendency upon hearing these to think, well, if I'm gonna be part of the Buddhist club, this is what I need to believe. These, this is the this is the dogma of the Buddhist club. So if if I'm going to be a full member, um, I need to to believe these things, and I need to start using this language. I I, I think that is really contrary to the spirit <laughs> with which um, the the Buddha offered these observations, and they were observations. whatever you may think about the Buddha, you have to agree that he was a keen observer, a keen observer of the inside and the outside, a keen observer of others, other people, other living things, plants, animals, and also a keen observer of himself. a keen observer of all that goes on inside. And having observed for many years as intently as he could, 
he crystallized his understanding of these principles and stated them in this way. Now, in, in some ways, there you can't either prove them or disprove them. I mean, okay, all compounded things are impermanent. That means that anything that arose by way of causes and conditions um, is, is bound to cease at some time. But to say that about all things is, um, is, is kind of specious because you, all it would take to disprove that is to find one <laughs> compounded thing that was permanent in the universe somewhere. Um, and, and to say that such a thing does not exist um, is, um, extends beyond uh, possible human knowledge, I would say. So, And on the other hand, it's awfully hard to disprove it too, because if you came up with something that you thought was permanent, how would you really know it's permanent? I mean, you can't, you can't observe it over eternity. So that tenant anyway is sort of neither provable nor disprovable in the usual way. And you could make sort of similar claims about perhaps the others. So why, why would the Buddha offer these observations? Well, I think upon his observing his experience as a human being, he found them pretty reliable. He found them extremely reliable. And, and also he found they had some utility that when you accepted these sort of principles about the way things are for, for humans living our existence, that you could save yourself a lot of trouble, that you could save yourself suffering. So that, that I think is the spirit with which the Buddha offered these observations to us to, to, help, to help people navigate their lives. To help them not be confused and deceived by appearances. So it's, um, it's not that you have to, you know, force yourself into a state of belief and become a member of the Buddhist club in order to use these. But these, these principles, the Buddha said, are good to keep in mind investigate, see how they correspond with your own experience. Work with them and use them. And that was, I think, why the Buddha offered them to us in this sort of short, memorable set of principles. So uh, the, the reason I got into talking about these 
at all in, in the context of talking about poetry is that I, I think these themes crop up again and again in Buddhist writings, whether it's poetry or any other, or sutras or whatever. And um, so I just wanted to keep them in mind. Now, um, so I, I did want to talk about a poem today, though, and we've we've discussed poems from hundreds of years ago, uh, many many centuries ago. Um, I, I'd like to talk about a poem that appeared in an anthology of Buddhist poetry um, from a poet who's relatively contemporary in comparison. Uh, he lived around the turn between the 19th and 20th centuries. He, um, he was born in 1884 and uh, died in 1918. So if you're quick at math, you can see that he lived a relatively short life. He died at 34 years of age. And he was born Zhuan Ying was his birth name. He was born in Yokohama, Japan, as kind of an accident, um, because he was the offspring of a Cantonese businessman and his Japanese maid. So he was born out of wedlock. With one parent being Chinese and the other being Japanese. And this was a time of great turmoil, uh, at least as great a turmoil <laughs> as we're experiencing now, um, especially in that part of the world. Because there was much, um, well, there was much interaction between Japan and China, but there was also a lot of friction. Uh, in fact, um, the first Sino-Japanese War occurred um, when Xuan Ying was about 11 years of age. And this was over some dispute uh, uh, about a port on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, it, um, the Chinese and the Japanese had a number of wars um, and, and all of them were, were very uh, bloody. It was also a time of turmoil in Japan or in China internally because um, Zhuang Ying ended up uh, spending some time in Japan, some time in China. Subsequently, he traveled a great deal, went to India and visited you know, various places in Southeast Asia. He, um, he lived a, a fairly eventful, however short life. Um, there were three occasions, uh, as, uh, as far as we know, where he uh, sought refuge in a Buddhist monastery. And, and the first one was when he was just a child. Uh, he was about 12 years of age, I think, something like that. And he, he was always kind of sickly. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But he was, um, he had, he was not a, a healthy individual. Um, and at one point during his childhood, when he was in the care of a relative, um, as, as the story goes, he, he, was, he was very, very sick and they sort of gave up on him. And um, I guess, you know, uh, they say they, they put him in the shed to die, basically. Um, but he didn't die. He survived, <laughs> he survived that episode. Um, but he, um, naturally had distrust of his caretakers and, and um, um, went to a, a nearby Buddhist monastery and um, 
was ordained there as a young, I don't know, 13 year old. Uh, but that didn't last very long because he just couldn't follow the rules. <laughs> so they ended up expelling him. And, um, and then he, uh, he went to uh, the various universities, um, both in Japan and in uh, Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai at that time uh, was partly occupied by the British. And um, so he attended um, a, um, a, uh, a university in, in occupied Shanghai, uh, learned languages. He was very facile with languages and he, he uh, uh, learned English and French. Uh, somewhere along the line, he learned uh, Sanskrit or at least to, to be able to read it. And um, a large part of his sort of professional life as a, as a writer involved translation. He, he translated uh, Victor Hugo's Les, Mis Les Miserables, which is like a, I don't know, a two or 3000 page book. Um, he translated it from French into Chinese. He also translated um, uh, Lord Byron's poems, a collection of them uh, from uh, English into uh, Chinese. So he did a lot of translation. He also functioned as a, as well as being a poet, he was also a journalist and he uh, got involved in the revolutionary movement in China. Uh, during his lifetime in China, um, uh, 2000 years of um, imperial, <laughs> imperial dynastic rule, um, uh, was overturned and, and uh, the Republic of China was established. It was about 1912. Uh, he, um, he was involved in, in sort of the revolutionary movement in China. Um, and that was one of the times he ended up uh, going to a monastery, but the, actually the second time he ended up going to a monastery I mentioned the first. The second was when he was also a teenager, but he was older. He had fallen in love with a Japanese girl and uh, the uh, parents of the girl did, um, didn't like the arrangement and uh, uh, demanded that their daughter not see um, Zhuan Ying again. So um, this was extremely upsetting to him. Um, but it was also upsetting to the girl apparently because she um, died uh, apparently uh, shortly after, after this. And uh, he, um, he went to a monastery at that time as well uh, in a great state of distress. He went on to write a novel <laughs> additionally <laughs> called The Lone Swan uh, about uh, sort of based on this episode, uh, a, ro a romantic novel. And then the third time he ended up going to a monastery was at the end, towards the end of his life, the last five years of his life he spent at a monastery and uh, he had and functioning as a journalist, but a lot of his uh, sort of revolutionary diatribes were were not um, were censored, and he got um, uh, frustrated with with the whole business and uh, and entered a monastery, where he stayed till the end of his life. Uh, but one of the aspects of his life that may have accounted for his poor health um, was that he had apparently what we would now call bulimia. He, um, there are stories about how he would just eat incessantly. Um, and um, he, was, he was never particularly overweight, but he, because um, he would you know, induce vomiting, but he would just eat incessantly, especially sweets. He was just um, drawn to them. So, um, 
it um, probably accounted for a certain amount of the of the poor health that he experienced. And perhaps for his short life, he had some sort of stomach problem that, um, that ended his life. So anyway, the poem, I, I mention all that because I think it's hard to, hard to uh, uh, fully appreciate the poem without knowing a little bit about, about his life. So the poem, um, his, his Buddhist name, by the way, was Su Manchu, uh, and that's how he's often referred to, Su Manchu. The poem is entitled, Having Hope or Holding On. Having Hope or Holding On. In this life, how could I hope to become a Buddha? Hermit dreams are undependable and my desires still unconquered. Many thanks, my friend, for all your kind inquiries, but I suspect my fates to be just a poet monk. In this life, how could I hope to become a Buddha? Hermit dreams are undependable and my desires still unconquered. Many thanks, my friend, for all your kind inquiries, but I suspect my fates to be just a poet monk. So um, kind of a simple poem in a way. And um, reading poems in translation, we lose um, the poetics of the language. Uh, uh, many of these Chinese poems were written in such a way that the characters on the page formed a pattern that, that was pleasing and, and artistic. Um, uh, Su Man Chu, Chu was also a, a painter. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, some people just um, are, are, have many, many gifts. <laughs> I don't understand it. Um, but, um, but I think, I think the sense, the emotional sense of the poem can, can come through even in, even in translation. So, Having hope or holding on. Are, are we supposed to draw a contrast there or a similarity? <laughs> uh, is this a contrast between having hope and sort of hanging in there, <laughs> gritting your teeth and putting up with it? Or is it the similarity between having hope and holding on to something, grasping something. I don't know, that's one question. And another question um, about this poem is, well, of course we don't, none of us have had the life experience of, of this person. <laughs> Um, but there is this sense, of, well, first of all, he had a lot of friends. I mean, he was actually even friend with Chiang Kai-shek who, who proved to be, you know, the revolutionary leader of, uh, of China. But I mean, he had, he had a lot of friends and acquaintances. And, and some friend apparently has written him a letter asking about how he is. And maybe even included something about what, are you trying to become a Buddha or what, you know, going to the monastery? We don't know. We don't know what uh, the friend, how, how the friend made this inquiry, whether it was in a, 
a kind, you know, passionate way or a disparaging way, we don't know. But in any case, he's responding to it. And saying, no, I, I don't think I'm going to become a Buddha in this lifetime. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I, I'm just going to be blank, you know, you can fill in the blank. But I, I think we perhaps all go through something similar <laughs> of having some um, aspiration for something. And um, at some point, identifying ourselves as just a blank, fill in the blank, whatever it is. And maybe even that identification isn't necessary, but it afforded him apparently some comfort to describe himself as a poet monk. So um, I don't know what you all make of this, but um, I, I, I thought it brought up some points uh, that, that might be helpful to discuss. And um, having hope or holding on, being just a fill in the blank. Um, so I, I thought I'll, I'll stop there and we can uh, uh, break up into some smaller groups to start with. Uh, maybe three of them. That seems to be a good number. And then reconvene in a few minutes and, um, and talk about this together.